As the sun said its final goodbyes over the horizon, we got ready to settle in for the night atop an enormous sand dune. The desert was a harsh place, but among good company, it wasn't so bad. As we began to settle in for the night, pitching the tents, starting the fire, we felt what started as a soft rumble through the sands. An earthquake, we thought at first? But before we could duck for cover, two massive fins began to rise out of the shifting earth, showering down upon us the same sand just moments ago we were resting upon. A being of impossible size rose from the surface of the desert, making its ascent into the skies, us along with it. Looking around, there were many others just like it, preparing for a journey through the air. I just hoped we would not find ourselves to be unwelcome stowaways. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of D&D, sometimes literally, and bring them to light for use in your 5th edition game. I'm your host Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we're going back to 4th edition. The creature I'm going to talk to you about today comes to us originally from the 4th edition version of the Dark Sun campaign setting, and can be found in one of the setting books for Dark Sun. If you haven't had the joy of playing in a Dark Sun campaign, it's something you've probably heard about around the internet. Truly, it's one of the most fantastic campaign settings if you are interested in post-apocalyptic or just survival-based D&D in any way. It's a very unique setting and as such resulted in some very unique creatures. And today I'm going to be telling you about the majestic beasts that roam the desert skies, the Cloud Ray. Now this creature does actually come to us in three separate varieties. We have the Pup, the Adult, and the Elder, which like many creatures in D&D that there are multiple versions of, is basically the same thing but just at different stages in their lifespan which for the Cloud Ray is thousands of years, so they have a lot of time to grow. These massive flying pancakes spend their days soaring through the desert skies or the skies of whatever environment your setting happens to be in. And as always, we're going to go over just what they can do in combat, so how you would run them in battle, and of course some plot hooks so you can actually use them in your game. But first things first, don't forget to look up if you're on watch tonight because it is time for... So when talking about these creatures, I think it makes the most sense if we start with the smallest one and work our way up to the biggest one. So at the very bottom of the totem pole, we have the newly born Cloud Ray Pups. Don't let their name fool you though, because they are actually quite large. Literally, they are large in size. So these creatures are babies, but they're about the size of a horse. They have a fly speed of 50, which is pretty fast, and they do have a move speed of 15. They're going to be flying through the sky all the time, but for whatever reason, if they're pinned to the ground and they are forced to move regularly, they're basically just going to result to flopping around trying to get where they need to go. So they're not too fast on the ground. As far as attacks actually go, they're pretty basic. They have one move called Sting. This is, of course, inspired by the creature that these guys are based on in real life, the Stingray. And it's a 10-foot range attack that causes a bit of thunder damage, and it forces a save. And on a failed save, the creature takes some lightning damage as well. And if they fail their save by more than 5, they are paralyzed. It does have one second action as well, called Gliding Attack. This basically allows the creature to make a sting attack and then move wherever it wants within its move speed without taking any attacks of opportunity. The only caveat here is it has to use all 50 of its fly speed. So if it's in a situation where it can't do that, it's just going to use a regular sting. Otherwise, it's pretty much always going to be using this move because it wants to move around, attack, and then move away. Especially for a flying creature against some parties, that can be quite problematic. They're very tied in with the realm of dream space, which is something we've only just started to investigate in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. With the addition of the Druid Circle of Dreams from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, we've just kind of touched the surface of that realm. The Cloud Rays have this kind of primeval origin and they are deeply tied to the idea of this dream space. They spend a long time resting under the earth when they're in their adult phase, so it just kind of ties into this whole idea that they are in some vague way connected with that realm. This is most exemplified, however, with this ability that all Cloud Rays have in one form or another called Dream Resurgence. The way this works for Cloud Ray Pups is when they are reduced to zero hit points, they look like they died normally. Their body falls to the ground and they just kind of seem to be dead. However, at the start of what would be that creature's next turn, their body disappears and the creature reappears up to 50 feet away with one hit point remaining. 
And of course, this dream resurgence ability can only be used once per day. This is very much magical and supernatural and why these creatures are very much monstrosities and not simply just beasts. Now, this dream resurgence type ability does manifest differently depending on how old the cloud ray is, but we're going to get into that in a second as we move on to the cloud ray adult. The adult is huge in size, has more than twice the amount of hit points, 311 to be exact. And much like the smaller one, it also has that same gliding attack where if it uses all of its move speed, which is 60 in this case, it can make its attacks without taking any attacks of opportunity. But this guy doesn't just sting, he also has a bite attack. It bites down with its crushing jaws and any creature that is unfortunate enough to be hit by this bite is also grappled by the creature. Now the adults and everything larger has this special trait that basically means when it's grappling something it doesn't hinder its movement in any way. It's just holding them in its mouth while it flies around which is terrifying because as any of you who have been grappled by a flying creature know, not all adventurers can fly so when they are then dropped to the ground they can take a lot of damage. This is a pretty common strategy that the adults employ when they're hunting something to feed their pups. They'll just scoop down, pick it up, carry it up into the sky, drop it, and then let the pups feed on whatever remains of the creature when it impacts the earth. Another big differentiating factor with the adult is as a bonus action, it can crush anything that is in its mouth, causing even more damage. So if it swoops down, stings someone, bites them, carries them up into the sky, crushes, and then as a free action lets go of them, that's going to be a ton of damage in one turn potentially, if you fail all your saves. Now as this creature has gotten a little older and gotten more in tune with the magical side of itself, it has acquired a new ability called Wingstorm. Essentially this creature can cause a massive upsurge of winds centered on itself and pushes back all creatures that are within 15 feet until they are 15 feet or further away. This also causes a bit of thunder damage and if the creature fails its save, it takes the full amount of thunder damage and is also knocked prone. This is a great way for it to shove off pesky adventurers that are stabbing its back. And as I said, all of these creatures have some version of that dream resurgence ability, but as the adult, they get a much more controlled version of it. They get something called dream flight, which basically once per day, rather than just teleporting 50 feet away when they drop to zero hit points, they can do this whenever they want. They can teleport up to 75 feet away, taking any creature they have grappled with them, and wherever they land, any creatures that are within 15 feet also take a bit of psychic damage and are pushed back. They also have to make a save or they're going to end up being stunned. And because this functions as a bonus action, it makes a fantastic escape maneuver. But you could also use it as the opening to an encounter if you really wanted to. The creature would be expending its one and only surefire escape method if it did this, but being able to just pop in from 75 feet away, do some psychic damage to everyone, possibly stun some of your opponents, and then still be able to swoop down and sting them or bite them is very effective. Again, that's hyper aggressive, but... Who knows, if the situation calls for it, maybe if it was going in to defend some of its pups or whatever the case was, I could see this being a very effective means of combat as well. So moving on to the Cloud Ray Elder, this is where things really start to get interesting. This creature is gargantuan. It is just massive in size. Its enormous body occupies a space of 75 feet, and because it's incredibly flat, this can almost function as part of the terrain sometimes. Now that said, there doesn't have to be a size cap. If you wanted to make, say, an elder version of this creature that had been around for even longer than most elders that have been seen, you could make it colossal and have it be the size of a football field or Central Park. Really, it could be whatever size you need it to be given the situation you have planned. But 75 feet is just kind of an average starting point to keep in mind. Now as I mentioned, this creature does have a perfectly flat body and it has a trait called flat body which just mechanically puts in writing that a creature can end its turn within the same space as a Cloud Ray Elder and not have to suffer any negative consequences. What this is basically saying in terms of how the game is actually run is yes, creatures can find themselves on a Cloud Ray Elder's back, running around, having battles, doing whatever, which essentially makes this creature part of the landscape at times. However, that said, this creature does have an aura constantly around it of undulating winds. Which means that when the Cloud Ray Elder chooses to have this ability active, every creature within 15 feet of it takes a few d6 damage and is moved 15 feet, still within 15 feet of the Cloud Ray Elder, to another space. Essentially meaning if you're on its back or close by, you're going to be tossed around a bit at the start of your turn by the crazy winds that are just always around this thing. This can make combat on the back of a Cloud Ray Elder very interesting because if the Cloud Ray Elder isn't even really engaged with what's happening on its body and you have two groups of enemies fighting each other, and for the beginning of each combatant's turn they take a little bit of damage and find themselves displaced within 15 feet of where they were before, 
that's going to make a pretty interesting and dynamic battle in a lot of cases. Not to mention the fact that there's literally a giant living, breathing creature manipulating which way the battlefield turns, literally in some cases. But moving on, like the adult and the pup, it does have a sting attack, except of course it's much more powerful, the save DC is higher to not be paralyzed by it, and it adds in some more dice of damage. And of course it has the bite attack that the adult has, but the elder's bite attack is a little bit different. Bite is replaced with an ability called scooping bite. And this doesn't function as a direct attack against a creature, it's more of an area of effect ability. Because its mouth is just so massive by this point in its lifetime, it essentially scoops down and targets all creatures within a 25 foot radius. Each one of those creatures has to make a dexterity save to try to get out of the way, and if any of them fail, they take the full damage of the bite and are also grappled. It can grapple up to three creatures in its massive maw, and of course it still has that bonus action to crush, so it can cause a lot of damage to several creatures all at once if it's successful. And again, the Windstorm ability that the adult has is further upgraded here with the Elder in an ability called Thunder Lash. Rather than simply target everything within 15 feet of it, it can target a specific creature and beat its wings down upon it, causing a massive amount of thunder damage to that one creature and everything within 25 feet of that space. Again, this also tosses everyone around within 15 feet of where they were originally standing. And lastly, it has an action called Gliding Menace, which is a much upgraded version of the Gliding Strike that the adult has. As long as it moves its full speed of 60, at three separate points during the movement it can make a Scooping Bite attack, a Thunder Lash attack, and a Sting attack. Of course, this also means during this movement it does not take any attacks of opportunity. Now this ability is on a recharge of 5 to 6 because it can be absolutely devastating to a group of enemies. But rest assured, any time it can use this trait, it is absolutely going to. And of course it also has that same Dream Flight ability that the adult has, and it works exactly the same way, the numbers are just a little bit higher. So that's what these guys can do in combat, they're pretty interesting and I think would make for some very dynamic battles, but how do we want to use this in our games? Well, I think you'd be surprised just by how diverse these creatures can be, so let's take a look at some. Much like their aquatic cousins in the ocean, the cloud rays will fly through the sky in schools. Usually these schools consist of an elder or two, maybe even three in some bigger groups, as well as a fair number of adults and a ton of pups. The creatures themselves are quite peaceful and are actually seldom dangerous unless provoked, and honestly the pups are the most likely ones to attack. As they're still growing, they're the ones who require the most amount of physical nourishment when it comes to eating other creatures. So if the party is going to be attacked by anything, it's most likely going to be an ambush from a group of hungry pups. And this is a good opportunity for you because if the party decides to engage these creatures, it's possible that a few of the wounded pups retreat only to find the mother who then comes in to see what's going on. It's also totally possible to just use these creatures as an interesting bit of nature, just some fauna to fill in your world and make it seem a little more unique and interesting. And if your PCs really do find the creatures that fascinating and they decide they're going to interact with them in some way, then you've got the stat block ready. Now as I mentioned, they do try travel in groups typically, however it is possible for a lone cloud ray to end up somewhere in the world. The most likely scenario would be if it was separated from its family as a pup and somehow survived in the wilds and then just ended up growing up on its own. This might make for a more aggressive cloud ray that is untrusting of many other people but it could be a useful tool for you in your game if you didn't want to have a big group of them. And who knows, maybe that's a side quest where the group has to reunite a lost pup with the rest of its family, that could be fun. Another way you could play this too, going from that same angle of having them as part of nature and not so much something to be interact with directly, is to essentially set them up as a hazard. If it happens to be the mating season of the Cloud Ray, maybe local caravans and merchants will know to avoid certain sections of the desert or certain sections of wherever they would normally travel through to complete their deliveries. Maybe this time of year, or maybe it's something that even only happens once every decade or so, all of the males are out trying to hunt the biggest, baddest creatures they can find. Your adventuring party themselves might not be cause for alarm, but no one wants to get caught up in a conflict between a cloud ray and a purple worm. And yet another way you could use this creature is as a setting for a battle or some kind of adventure. As I mentioned before, it would make for a pretty dynamic battle to be on the back of a cloud ray, but how do we get there? Well, the elders are known for taking very long periods of rest. They have a metabolism that can subsist mostly off of just arcane energy. They very rarely need to actually eat, so sometimes they'll go to sleep under the sand dunes or again wherever your setting is, and they'll be there for years, sometimes even decades at a time. 
So maybe what seems like a particularly large sand dune that your party rests upon for the evening actually ends up being a cloud ray who then ascends into the sky with the party on their back. Maybe it's possible that the party has a random encounter that night and they're attacked by a group of orcs or something. And the combat happening almost directly on the back of this massive creature is enough to rouse it from its slumber and it takes off into the sky with the party and orcs still battling on its back in tow. And then of course, once the battle is over, the party just has to hang on long enough so that they don't fall to their deaths and who knows where they might land and end up. This might take a routine journey from one town to another into a place of survival where the party is just trying to figure out where they are and get back to where they want it to go. Another possibility here too is maybe a group or some kind of society has domesticated a cloud elder. Perhaps there's a cloud ray elder that's home to a group of nomadic monks and they work in tandem with each other, kind of like a symbiotic relationship. The cloud ray takes them where they need to go and in turn the monks protect it and offer some kind of companionship to this creature. That would make really interesting flavor for a group of monks and would also make it interesting if you were trying to track them down. You could use the same angle with something even like a mercenary band, although a little less wholesome. Maybe this mercenary band has tamed a cloud ray elder and they use it as some kind of weapon or as like a mobile base. I could totally picture it now, the band of the cloud ray. They might have some kind of reputation as being just totally brutal. The people of the land might live in constant fear of the enormous shadow that covers villages and strongholds alike. Just moments before Black Maw, the massive cloud ray elder descends. Blotting out the sun with its impossibly large form, the raiders of the cloud ray then come down on grappling hooks to raid and loot the villages. If you want to go for a bit more innocent of an angle, maybe there's some kind of powerful mystic and she lives on the back of a cloud ray and just travels amongst them. Maybe she's notoriously hard to find and when the party needs her help, they go on a mission to track this person down. Or maybe these creatures are more commonplace in your world and not quite as rare as they seem to be in a lot of other places. A domesticated group of cloud rays could be used as some sort of transit. Maybe you can purchase a ticket to take a trip on a cloud ray from one city to another rather than expend your precious resources getting across the desert. It also seems like a great alternative to ship if you have a long way to go overseas. I'm aboard, explorers. I feel a migration song coming on. Oh! Or for more of a mysterious kind of adventure, maybe they're being hunted by something. Dead cloud rays are showing up around the forest's edge, and there's a group of local citizens from a tribe nearby that are very concerned as they kind of revere the cloud rays, but also wonder what could possibly be hunting such massive creatures like this. As I mentioned before, they have this kind of weird nebulous connection with the realm of dreams. So if you happen to have a circle of dream druid in your group, maybe they feel some kind of calling towards this locale and they're not really sure why. Every time they fall asleep, they just feel this mystical connection to some place. So the party goes to investigate and maybe upon arriving, they have some sort of supernatural encounter with a cloud ray elder who asks them for their help. Perhaps they're being hunted by an evil black dragon or something equally terrifying and large that would be able to actually threaten cloud Ray. The party then has the option to help them and maybe they're rewarded with some kind of boon in return. Maybe instead of cloaks of the manta ray, they're all given cloaks of the cloud ray. Something that allows you to have swim speed through the air once a day. But ultimately these gargantuan sky pancakes are amongst some of my favorite creatures from 4th edition and I really hope you can find a way to fit them into your game. Even if they're just used as a set piece or an interesting vista while your party looks over a cliff's edge. If you have used these creatures in the past or had them used in one of the games you've played in, please tell me about it in the comments below. I would love to hear about it. And as always, if you would like to use this creature in your game, you can find a link to the stat block in the description below. I've done up a conversion for all three different versions of this creature. So no matter what your needs are, the stat block to facilitate them should be there. And of course, if you are one of my lovely patrons, you can find the premium monster manual style stat block on the Patreon page, which was posted yesterday. And as always, I just want to thank you guys so much for watching. If you've got any suggestions for creatures you'd like to see me cover in the future, please leave a comment tweet at me, whatever, tell me in some way, and I will add them to my list of creatures to investigate. In any case, thanks again for watching, I'll see you in the next video. Till then!